Well, uh, thanks a lot for the, to the organizers for uh, inviting me to attend this year. It's been a very interesting last few days. I also just want to apologize for my voice. I seem to have managed to completely lose it this week, so I'm sort of croaking here, but hopefully uh, you guys can bear with me and it'll last through the end of this talk. Um, so Cinti asked me to provide just some general background on concepts related to thermochronology with a particular emphasis on low temperature thermochronology with some applications to sort of continental evolution along the lines of some of the problems that we've been talking about over the last few days. So, um, to, and of course, you guys should, as you have been throughout, you know, the last few days, interrupt with questions and such if um, things are, are not clear um, or just general additional questions about concepts. So thermochronology is essentially a tool that allows us to decipher thermal histories. And so, um, as you know, many, perhaps most of the processes that we've been talking about over the last few days are either heavily influenced by or have a strong influence on temperature regimes. So whether this be magmatism, metamorphism, deformation, uh, evolution of rheology and exhumational processes, all of these things are intimately linked with temperature. And so thermochronology is really a, a fundamentally important tool for allowing us to decipher the evolution of thermal regimes and therefore place you know, really critical constraints on the timing, duration, and rates of a whole variety of processes that are operative throughout um, you know, all levels of the crust. And so um, modern thermochronology provide, allows us to um, gain really unprecedented resolution of thermal histories from really high temperatures, you know, on the order of 1,000 degrees C down to temperatures as low as, you know, 30 degrees C, like really temperatures at the surface. And I know Rick Carlson showed this, this slide in his, um, in his sort of overview the other day. And so this is just plotting some of these different thermochronometers and geochronometers that we use relative to their temperature sensitivity. And some of the, the sort of closure temperatures of these different minerals are, have sort of, some of these are, are not quite accurate. Some of these have changed since the development of this, since this slide was put together um, about 10 years ago. So um, just to sort of conceptually show sort of how thermochronology works, and then we'll, we'll spend a little bit of time talking a little bit more quantitatively about sort of closure temperature ideas. And so um, this is a, sort of just a little temperature diagram going from high to low temperatures. And this particular example is for helium diffusion in a zircon. But the same sort of general concepts apply to all of these different thermochronometers. So you start off and you have your mineral that has, in this case, trace amounts of uranium and thorium in it that decays to helium. And so if you're at a, temp a temperature above a certain threshold, so... Um, you have um, your uranium and thorium atoms. So I'm not going to review the different geo, um, sort of decay equations and this kind of thing. But of course, uranium and thorium decays to helium. And so at temperatures above a certain threshold, those u uranium and thorium atoms are generating helium. And those heliums, this is hot enough that that helium is being completely lost from the crystal. So if you went and somehow you know, drilled a drill core and captured this sample and you dated it, you would get a zero age for this sample. Now, when the sample subsequently cools, you get to this lower temperature where the helium is completely locked in your mineral structure. And so at this point, your time clock has essentially started. And so, um, right, so when you're up at this, this high temperatures, you essentially have zero age. As you get to these lower temperatures, you start accumulating daughter. And really, this threshold temperature where you go from this regime of complete helium loss to complete helium retention, this is actually ends up being a zone of temperatures, and we'll talk a little bit about that. This is known as the closure temperature. And so um, this general concept, again, applies to these different thermochronometers. Now, um, this is a slightly different plot than what I showed you before, and I'm going to keep switching back and forth between which way is up for the higher temperatures here. So in this case, we have lower temperatures here, higher temperatures here, and here again, I'm plotting some of these different thermochronometers. Um, but in a slightly different way. So here, I've just grouped these. Um, in this case, for the, I guess really the four main thermochronometer systems that people use are the uranium lead system, uh, the fission track system, and the euthorium helium system, all of which are based on decay of uranium and thorium, um, and then the argon argon system. And um, so uh, the cool thing is that, for example, in the uranium lead system, we have a whole variety of minerals that contain uranium and, th and thorium. And so in the case of zircon, the closure temperature of zircon is on the order of 900 degrees C. So if you have a magma that comes in and crystallizes, and um, you're at, let's say, a temperature of 600 degrees C, um, because you're at a temperature that's lower than 
uh, the closure temperature, you're immediately going to be starting to lock in those lead atoms. And so in most cases, for zircon in magmatic systems, you're generally obtaining the crystallization age of the rock. And so, so sort of you can think of geochronometers as minerals grow below their closure temperature such that the dates actually record the crystallization age of the rock. Now, in contrast, you can also apply this uranium lead system to other minerals like titanite, rutile, and apatite, and these have different temperature sensitivities and different closure temperatures. So in the case of apatite in the uranium lead system, you're looking at a closure temperature of about 400 degrees C. So in this case, your rock comes in and it crystallizes, but and at, let's say, a temperature of 600 degrees C, but you're not at that temperature, apatite is going to be completely losing its lead and it's going to have a zero age. And it's not until that rock cools below temperatures of 400 degrees C that you're going to start accumulating the daughter and therefore obtain a date for that rock. Um, and so... Um, Right, so another actually important point I wanted to make, and I'm just going to go back to this slide here, is the fact that for thermochronometers, in many cases, the primary crystallization age of your mineral does not necessarily matter that much. So, for example, I will, I'll show you some results for samples that I've worked on, for example, from the Acastanices, which are you know, some of the oldest, the oldest known rock in the world, as well as samples from the Barbton Greenstone Belt, the ancient gneiss nice complexes. And so the crystallization age of those, of those rocks are like 4 billion years old or 3.6 billion years old. But as long, um, if we date um, an appetite from those samples, as long as that sample has had the opportunity to be heated up to temperatures sufficient to lose the helium from the sample, the helium date that you're obtaining for those samples is not a crystallization age. It has nothing to do with the crystallization age of that appetite. What it's telling you is something about the much younger cooling history. So in many ways, you can think of the thermochronometer system being largely decoupled from the primary crystallization age of the mineral, if that makes sense. Are there any questions so far? All right. So... Um, so, of course, we can apply these um, thermochronometers to, to a whole array of processes. And so um, we can sort of apply high to moderate temperature thermochronology is commonly applied to problems sort of in the middle to uh, lower crust. And so um, Roberta's talk uh, yesterday made, made me sort of harken back to my days as a PhD student working with Sam Bowering. And in that, um, my research with him, I was working on a very large exposure of a uh, very heterogeneous exposure of lower crustal rocks up in the Canadian Shield. And this is just a photograph of some of those rocks. And um, in that work, I was really had applied pretty much that most of the thermochronometers that I showed you in that previous slide. And essentially what we were trying to do is um, unravel the metamorphic and unroofing history of these rocks to gain some insights into the initial stabilization and evolution of that craton. So, for example, we had determined the primary... Um, sort of metamorphic age of these rocks in the Archean that we interpreted to represent sort of initial stabilization of the craton. We saw a later second high-grade metamorphic event that we interpreted to um, indicate destabilization of the craton at that time in the Proterozoic. And then we applied this whole different battery of thermochronometers in which we sort of were able to track in a high level of detail the exhumation of different blocks of lower crust to the surface. And so thermochronology can be really powerful in sort of deciphering these sorts of histories. And so here I'm just showing a, a plot of some geotherms. And so here in blue is the crust, and here is the lithospheric mantle. And so this is sort of meant to represent a cretonic sort of section. And so in blue are sort of conductive steady state um, geotherms that might be, um, for example, applicable to cratons. And so what you will note here is that, for example, in the coolest geotherm here that might be... Um, again, representative of these relatively cold cratons. You know, our temperatures at the base of the crust are on the order of 400 degrees C. Um, and then in red are shown advective geotherms. And so these different letters represent different thermochronometers that are plotted relative to their closure temperatures. And so I'm mainly just showing this to um, try to convey the idea is that if we, you know, go and work on an exposure of lower crustal rocks or work on lower crustal xenoliths, we can actually use these thermochronometers to gain some insight into, okay, what's the thermal history here at the base of the crust? What is that telling us about when we are in some sort of a cratonic steady state, when we must have had some sort of major perturbation of the lithosphere in order to get disruption and have maybe some sort of metamorphic event. And then we can use these thermochronometers again to sort of track the evolution of the lower crust back to steady state regimes. And so this can, you know, not only allows us to learn something really important, I think, about the, how the lower crust works, but it also allows us to gain some really important insights into well, what's happening at, you know, the scale of the entire lithosphere. Because you have to be doing, since most of the time, the lower crust is being insulated by this 
thick lithospheric mantle root, you have to be doing something pretty dramatic to the lower crust in order to cause these sorts of histories. So that's just sort of a, a sort of brief example of some of the applications of sort of these uh, low to moderate temperature thermochronometers to some of the problems that we um, have been talking about over the last couple of days. And then um, low temperature thermochronology, people typically um, sort of group uh, both the appetite fission track and euthorium helium systems um, into uh, this category. And we'll talk more about, um, we'll, we'll spend more time here talking about the euthorium helium system, but this is just a block diagram um, showing um, isotherms, which are these planes of constant temperature beneath the Earth's surface. And so um, the basic idea here is that these low temperature thermochronometers are sensitive, of course, to very low temperatures. And they allow us to gain insights into when the upper sort of one to five kilometers of crust were eroded and brought to the surface, which can give some insights into uplift processes and the like. And so again, we'll, we'll be talking more about this diagram in uh, a few minutes. So what we're going to do is we're um, I'm first just going to cover some additional sort of thermochronology basics um, having to do with closure temperatures and how we determine the diffusion kinetics of minerals. And this is just a, a note. These are some of the slides that I use in my intro ge geochronology class. And so some of these slides are just from Kip and from David, just from um, the materials that I've pulled together as well as some additional material that I've put in there. Um, and then we'll talk some more about a, a bit more. We're going to focus in on the euthorium helium system and some fundamentals associated with that and how one tends to think about euthorium helium data. And then finally, I'm going to um, give a few examples from my recent uh, research, um, examples from the uh, North American Cratonic Interior and the Southern African Plateau work we're, that we're doing using low temperature thermochronology to decipher burial and unroofing histories there. And then um, actually the Colorado Plateau stuff we're going to save until this afternoon in this um, sort of a debate that we are planning to have, that we hope to have, um, to sort of set up the Colorado Plateau problem and then have a discussion of the different um, kinds of mechanisms that could explain the erosion patterns that we observe on the plateau. So are there questions so far? Any questions? Okay. All right, so, um, so these thermochronometer um, essentially, I mean, they depend on our understanding of diffusion. And so, um, of course, diffusion is temperature dependent. Um, and simple diffusion scales exponentially with temperature. So, of course, if you're at high temperature, your system's open. When you're at lower temperatures, your system is closed. And so if we just look at our plot of daughter versus elapsed time, okay, so if you're at high temperatures, you have completely open system behavior. So you have no daughter accumulating. Um, so your daughter to parent ratio is zero, so you get a zero age. And then um, once you have completely closed system behavior, you get total retention of the daughter that's being produced um, by the systematic decay of the parent. And so in this case, you get the progressive increase in the age of your sample. Now in reality, there is a sort of a transitional regime so as the system cools, we might expect to have an early history of purely open system behavior, a later history of purely closed system behavior, and a sort of intermediate regime where we have sort of partial retention and partial loss of the daughter. And this is true of most thermochronometer systems. This becomes actually much more pronounced for the euthorium helium system, um, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. So the closure temperature concept, so this is essentially a, a definition that was um, by Dodson. This was defined as the temperature of a system at the time of its measured date. Okay, so here again is our plot of daughter versus uh, daughter over parent versus time. So here we go from closed system behavior, no daughter retention, to um, open system behavior. I'm sorry, and to closed system behavior, and then we have this sort of curved region where we're undergoing this transition. And so this is our, our cooling history over time. And so um, the closure temperature is formally defined as the temperature of the system at the time of this measured date. And so this is why you know, these different thermochronometers, of course, have these very different closure temperatures. <clears throat> In reality, we have a, a closure temperature equation that is um, dependent on a, a number of different factors. Um, we have the various diffusion parameters that go into this computation as well as things such as grain size and cooling rate actually in detail have an influence on the closure temperature. Um, 
But those are sort of secondary effects that in some cases, when you do really detailed thermochronometer studies, you can um, sort of uh, see some of these uh, detailed effects. But the, the main thing is just a basic understanding of what, what is a closure temperature and how does that work. So we actually, so in order to understand thermochronometers, we need to understand how these daughters diffuse in our mineral of interest. So our ability to accurately interpret thermochronology data is really fundamentally dependent on how well we understand the diffusion kinetics of the daughter in the system. And so um, <clears throat> there are a variety of ways in which its um, work is done to try to characterize these diffusion um, parameters. Um, based on many different experimental studies of natural systems, so the diffusion, um, diffusion has been found to depend exponentially on, on temperature through this Arrhenius relationship. And so here you have your, diffusion, your diff diffusivity at your conditions of, of interest. Um, and so D naught is your diffusivity at different infinite temperature. Um, e is your activation energy. And then T and um, R is your gas constant. T, of course, is temperature. And again, the main point here is that you know, D um, depends exponentially on temperature. And again, there are a variety of ways in which people um, use uh, to try to get at the diffusivities of these systems. In the case, and I'm going to give just a simple example of how we do this for noble gases. This is really the, the simplest uh, system in which to characterize diffusion kinetics. Um, uh, so for example, the argon system and the euthorium helium system, it's really nice because you can actually do experiments in the lab and measure how your daughter is released from your sample. And so to do this, people do these, um, a lot of work doing these experimental diffusion studies that are, again, appropriate for gaseous species. They involve these controlled heating experiments. And so what you do is you take your sample and you progressively um, heat it up at your known sort of temperature and time. Um, and you can actually determine D as a function of the fractional helium loss. And so we can actually plot our results of these diffusion experiments so we... Um, uh, based on that Herrhenius relationships, and we get arrays like these, and we can calculate D naught, um, which is the intercept here, and we can calculate the activation energy, which is dependent on the slope, um, as a, a, as a um, result of these sorts of diffusion studies. So again, this is, this is the approach that is used in um, these sort of, for these sorts of gaseous um, species. But this is how we, uh, yes? And P is the same for uh, all the minerals? Or in no, time? no, it's different. It's different, and it depends. So it depends. So D depends both on uh, the mineral and on the nature of the daughter. So again, so like if you have the uranium lead system, you can have um, you know your you have different. So D is related to the closure temperature. In the uranium lead system, your closure temperatures for zircon, titanite, apatite, and rutile are different. We can also look at the uranium lead system versus the euthorium helium system, for example, in zircon. So the uranium lead system has a really high closure temperature in zircon, whereas the euthorium helium system in zircon has a very low closure temperature. So it's dependent both on the nature of the daughter that's diffusing as well as the crystal structure. Yeah? What, what those, uh, high uh, yeah, that's a, that's a good point, actually. So what, what um, we think is going on there is that uh, and this is what Ken initially proposed, is that you're actually beginning to anneal the sample. So sometimes one of the challenges in doing these experiments in the lab is that you worry about, as you're progressively heating up the sample, that you're changing the physical structure. And so here we think that we're actually annealing out some of the damage and it's actually changing the characteristics. So in this case, you want to look at this part of the array to get at the diffusivity parameters. Other questions? Yes. Um, well, I mean, you can have fluid processes. So I guess I would say two things in re response to that. So I guess you can have fluid-assisted processes that would cause um, loss of the daughter, but in a way that's not uh, due to diffusion, in which case you could have, like, fluid-induced leaching of your daughter, in which case you couldn't really use this closure temperature concept then, which is dependent on diffusion. The second thing is that we now also know that there are some other factors that influence diffusion kinetics. For example, in the euthorium helium system, and I'll mention this 
in a, a few slides here, we know, for example, that the accumulation of radiation damage defects in crystal can actually change the diffusivity character of a mineral. Um, so there are other, are other factors like that that can come into play. Yeah, so in some rare cases, yeah, so in some cases, I mean, so if you um, have your appetites that have been leached by fluids sitting at the surface, you know, you can actually, and I mean, I've, I've worked on appetites like this, and I know not to do that in the future, because they will commonly look very pitted, and you can actually induce leaching of the daughter in a non-diffusional way. And in that case, you can't really, you can't use these equations, you can't use this sort of interpretational framework, because there's a different process that's causing the loss of the daughter. On which, on sort of this general idea, or? Yeah, uh, yeah sure. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Yes. So if it's under deformation, does that also affect? Uh, it would be driving, I mean, it's driving it in a particular direction, but not necessarily speeding up or slowing down the process, but there's more energy. Yeah. Um, so there have been oh sure yeah so he's asking whether deformation can influence the diffusion kinetics and um, there have been so in most cases I would say no but there actually have been one or two studies done in zircon where people have been doing some EBSD work um, looking at deformed zircons and they actually can see that. Uh, it looks like some of the zircon has been reset by the deformation, and that probably has something to do with defects. Um, but that's like really new work, and um, I, I don't think that's not generally a widely considered process. Yeah. Anything else? Okay. So I just wanted to introduce one more sort of concept. Um, uh, to this, although I'm not really going to be talking about this in any of the examples today. So, um, you know, we sort of commonly think of, uh, I don't know, some people sort of, you tend to think of closure temperatures being like this on-off switch, right? But it's actually not. <laughs> the way the system works is not like an on-off switch. It's more like a dim switch in terms of how the radiogenic daughter begins to accumulate in your mineral. So, for example, sometimes we get unzoned grains, and sometimes we can get grains that are zoned. So, for example, if this is our, a mineral, like a mica, or it might be for the argon system. Uh, well, here we're doing this for argon, so we're going to figure this is a mica. So if we take our sample and we cool it like instantaneously, we're going to have a uniform distribution of ages across our sample. However, if we take that same mineral and we cool it really, really slowly, and take it slowly through that regime in which you're partly retaining and partly losing the daughter, you can get your crystal to be zoned. So um, you're going to have younger ages at the edge of the, of the crystal than in the interior. And if you just do bulk dating of the sample, for example, if you just zap the whole thing with a laser, this grain or this grain, all you're going to do is get a bulk age. And you won't have this additional information about the zonation. So I think one, one sort of a, a approach that people use is to try to tease out the nature of this zonation, sort of the spatial distribution of the radiogenic daughter at the margin of the crystal to try to get additional information about the thermal histories. And so people tend to do this in two ways. In the argon system, you can um, do this using uh, laser ablation techniques. So people, are, you know, you can take your crystal and you can actually zap it there and zap it there and zap it there and actually get age gradients, which is very interesting. Uh, the other thing that people do are step heating experiments. And so um, if you guys are, have heard of uh, sort of the most widely known, I guess, examples of this would be in the argon-argon system, where people generate these argon spectra. So this is a, a plot of age versus, this is cumulative argon-39 uh, released. Um, well, essentially what you can think of this, you can think of this as being, you know, this is essentially our age. So for our unzoned grain, you're going to have just uniform ages across the entire grain. Um, so I guess I should back up and say, so essentially when you do, so essentially what you do is you take one of these crystals and you progressively heat it up in the same way sort of that you do for those diffusion experiments. So you progressively degas out the argon. And 
the assumption is that you're essentially starting to mine out the argon at the edges of the crystal, and then you're progressively mining inwards. And so um, people generate these sorts of spectra. And so if you get um, spectra that are flat, that look like this, it tells you that your grains are unzoned, and for example, would tell you that this grain cooled quickly. Whereas in other cases, you might get spectra that look like this, where you have ages at the edge that are younger than those in the interior. And so this tells you that perhaps you either have slow cooling or you have, could have, for example, partial resetting during reheating. And so there's also a, a newer technique in the euthorium helium system known as 4.3 thermochronometry that I, I'm, I don't think I'm going to really talk about today, but it essentially does this, is uh, sort of a new uh, variant of the euthorium helium technique that similarly allows us to get at the spatial distribution of helium in the apatite crystal. So again, you just have additional information from, based on where exactly the radiogenic daughter resides in the crystal. Are there any questions? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, depends on the mineral. I mean, like monazite, you get spectacular zoning, commonly not in a concentric, concentric form. Apatite, you can get zoning, but um, in cathode luminescence, it's less pronounced. So, I mean, in the case of zircon, yeah, I mean, that, those, those domains don't represent what I'm talking about here. Those are growth domains. Whereas in this case, these sorts of diffusive profiles, so you can think of these as being diffusive profiles, so these wouldn't be visible in looking at the crystal in like cathode luminescence because you can't, you know, sort of see <laughs> the distribution of the radiogenic daughter, which is why we have to use these other sorts of fancy techniques to get at that. Yeah, Roberta. I'm a little bit confused about your example there because with the crystal on the right, um, yeah. No, actually. So it's the other way around. That's a good, that's a good question. Yeah. So, um, so I guess you know what you want to think about is is sort of so this is the zone from which you're losing your daughter. So, uh, so you know you start going through this temperature regime where you know some of the argon's getting locked in and some of it's getting out. So you might think that maybe you know your argon's moving around a little bit in the interior, but it can't move enough. It's not hot enough. Like the argon can only move a little bit, so it's not hot enough to get out. Whereas the stuff at the edge, it's actually you know got a short escape path, and so you start sort of locking in the older age in the middle, and then you cool progressively outward. So it's just like a you know diffusion profile, just like you know like a if you think about the cooling history of a magma chamber, you know, sort of the same same thing. It's all diffusion. Yes. Uh, well, that's going to tell you that you've got some other funny business going on. <laughs> so there's actually, you know, uh, people who do this kind of kind of work, they worry a lot about, you know, they sometimes get weird spectra. And so there can be other sort of contamination issues. So sometimes you can get low temperature alteration, which is going to give you funny business at the beginning, might give you high steps. There are also some assumptions that you have to make about what is your initial component of your argon isotope, your daughter, that is not from decay, and you have to make assumptions about that. And so sometimes those assumptions might be incorrect, and you might be able to detect that by looking at the spectra because your spectra is weird. <laughs> so you can actually use the spectra to try to figure out what's going on, and it gives you a sense of like, oh, well, I better not trust this. Yeah. Yes? You mean in terms of getting this profile? Right. So, so you're asking, so I, I need to remember to repeat the questions here. So you're asking, I mean, I guess you could have, what hap I guess you're sort of asking what happens if you have a more complicated thermal history? Yeah, or like what if the thermal history goes above and below that yeah. particular point? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it depends on exactly what the thermal history is. But yeah, you can end up, I mean, in the end, you're pretty much, for a simple system, you're going to end up with some sort of a diffusion profile. So, you know, in the case of this system, like for the argon system, so let's say our 
So you might have a zone crystal like this, right? And, so, and then you have something happen, and you heat it up. So if you heat it up above the closure temperature, let's say you heat it up above 400 degrees C, you're going to completely wipe out this history. It's gone. You have no access to it anymore. And then you cool and you lock in a new profile. Alternatively, you could take it up and sort of partially lose this profile and then superimpose another profile on it. So there are more complicated histories that could lead to the same diffusion profiles. And commonly what we try to do in thermochronology is, is you try to use other geological constraints and sort of constrain the range of viable time temperature paths. And I'll, I'll come to a more specific example in a few minutes. Any other questions? Okay. So now we're going to move on and talk uh, more specifically about the euthorium helium system. And right, so uh, the euthorium helium system is based on the radiogenic decay of isotopes of uranium and thorium. So uh, it's a pretty awesome thing that we have this decay scheme because it gives rise to the uranium lead system. Uh, gives rise to the euthorium helium system because as you um, have the decay of these isotopes ultimately to lead uh, along the way, you generate a lot of helium atoms. The other thing that the system does, this is also the foundation of that um, fission track system, which kind of works analogous to the euthorium helium system. I'm not going to really talk so much about that system, but it works in a similar way. It's another low temperature thermochronometer. Uh, what? And geoneutrinos. Yes. <laughs> I mean, it's amazing how much we know about the Earth based on the uranium and thorium system, the radiogenic decay system. So we hadn't didn't have these, these systems. We would know uh, uh, probably a fraction of what we know today about how the Earth has evolved. Um, <clears throat> what was Q there? Uh, heat, I guess. <laughs> probably heat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so most helium is produced by uh, the decay, again, of uranium uh, to uranium isotopes and, and thorium. We get a little bit that's generated by, by samarium as well. So that's your helium for production. So the euthorium helium system is kind of interesting in that... Um, it's actually sort of the oldest to your chronometer. So Ruth Rutherford first proposed U-helium dating in 1905. It's the first to your chronometer. Um, in 1954, Hurley applied, tried applying the technique to date a variety of geologic materials, but they were like, oh, well, we got all these problems because um, the system tended to yield results that were unreasonably young based on comparison with other sort of stratigraphic constraints, and some crystals gave sort of unreasonable ages. And so people abandoned this technique for many years. And so it's interesting because now I kind of tend to think of the euthorium helium um, business as it's a pretty young one. It's only really been widely applied in the last 20 years or so. And to me, this means that, I don't know, there's a, I think there's a huge potential to apply euthorium helium in, in a whole variety of new and interesting ways and in new minerals. So um, there's sort of renewed interest in the late 80s. Zeitler proposed use of the euthorium helium system in appetite as a thermochronometer, but then things sort of sense, set, sat static for a while. And then Ken Farley is the one, I think, who really brought this into uh, the mainstream in terms of developing a me uh, means in the laboratory to make uh, the analyses pretty straightforward and um, routine. And so he um, dealt with things like uh, alpha particle emission from the grain edges. I don't really think I need to talk about that, but... Um, it's a correction that we need to make um, from the margins of the crystal. It's usually tractable, but it has to be done. Um, and then he carried out these sorts of diffusion experiments that I talked about a few minutes ago. That Actually, the one I showed you was sort of the classic one to characterize appetite helium diffusivity. And since then, hundreds of papers have been published using this tool because it really is the lowest temperature sensitivity thermochronometers and gives us information about that shallowest level of the crust. Um, and so most applications so far have focused on apatite and zircon, which are very common minerals. Um, obviously zircon because it is so common, apatite because it's, again, really sensitive to low temperatures. But the interesting thing is that pretty much any uranium and thorium bearing mineral can be dated. I think it has even more widespread uh, utility um, in terms of applicability to different minerals in the uranium lead system, because like for the uranium lead system, you have to worry about things like common lead. Generally, you don't have to worry about that for the helium system. So other possibilities on which some work has been or is being carried on, out on include titanite, monazite, xenotite, rutile, magnetite, gertite, epidote, bedelliite, garnet, 
all kinds of things that people are working on and that I think have the potential, with a, actually some additional work, to um, potentially become mainstream uh, thermochronometers, and it allows you potentially to, to work on some really, really interesting problems. For example, there's a really big push now. People are doing a lot of work on the iron oxides, like gertite and hematite, which, you know, if you could date gertite, then you could date, you know, timing of movement of faults, the development of paleosalts. This is a really low-temperature thermochronometer. And so there's all kinds of, I think, really interesting potential to apply some of these minerals in um, new and interesting ways. Uh, that's a good question. So he's asking, is the closure temperature of these different minerals very different? Um, some of these are not extreme, very well characterized, but for example, the closure temperature of zircon is on the order of 180 degrees C. So many of these minerals, I would say, like zircon, titanite, monazite, I think rutile, magnetite, their closure temperatures are sort of between 180 and 200, 180 and 250 degrees C. So many of these are, are sort of similar. Some of these we just don't know. Some of them, like gertite, are potentially really low, like 30 degrees C. Um, so there is some variability within that. Any other questions? OK. So I'm um, going to come back to this diagram to talk a little bit more about the appetite euthorium helium uh, system. So uh, again, this block diagram is showing sort of um, isotherms beneath the Earth's surface. And of course, temperatures increase with depth beneath the Earth's surface. And interestingly, when you're close to the surface, they actually mimic the topography. And that mimicking sort of decreases with depth. So um, if we just look at sort of this temperature range, um, so um, again, so appetite has trace amounts of uranium and thorium in the crystal structure that decays to helium. So at temperatures above about, let's say, 80 degrees C, this has sort of evolved over time a little bit, but let's say 80 degrees C, helium is completely lost from the crystal structure. So when you're down here, if you put a drill core down there and dated your sample, you get a zero age. Whereas at temperatures below about 30 degrees C, helium is completely locked in the crystal structure. And then you have this temperature range, which is sort of this, it's called the partial helium retention zone, in which helium is completely uh, lost from the crystal and partly retained. Um, and so, again, what we do with thermochronology is fundamentally we use it to decipher thermal histories. And then we have to make additional assumptions about other processes, such as geothermal gradients, to constrain the regional unroofing history, for example. Um, so, you know, again, we can use this tool to figure out when did a rock from, when did this rock get to the surface? When did this rock pass through the upper few kilometers of the Earth's crust? The other thing, because of the way in which these isotherms mimic the topography, sometimes if we sample cleverly, we can actually constrain when paleotopography developed. So I wanted to talk a little bit more about this notion of the helium partial retention zone, because I think this is one thing that makes the helium system, I don't know, a little bit different in terms of how one thinks about the dates than many of the other geochronology systems. And I think it makes it slightly confusing for people from the outside to kind of understand what a helium date actually means. So um, here is um, okay, a plot of increasing temperature, which you can think of in, as increasing depth beneath the Earth's surface, versus your helium date. Okay, So again, so if we're at temperatures above about 70 degrees C, you have no retention of helium in your crystal structure. So we're down here, you have a zero age. Okay? Now, if you're up at the surface, you have complete retention. So um, this is, so what happens over time is we can get um, the develop of a helium partial retention zone depth profile. Okay? So now we're just looking at a, 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 an array of helium ages through the crust. And so this is a, a chunk of crust that has sat isothermally for 55 million years. Okay, so sort of the tricky part of the helium system is that, so when you get down to temperatures like, so if we ha we're sitting here isothermally at about 50 degrees C, well, that appetite there, it's going to have a date. <laughs> okay, in this case, it's about 30 million years. Now, and this is simply a function of the fact that it's sitting there, and some of the helium is being lost, and some of it's being retained. But that date does not necessarily tell you when it crossed the 70-degree isotherm. 
Okay, so if we look at this profile, we actually, again, we have full retention, no retention, and we have this sort of regime of partial retention. So this sort of gets to the point that I wanted to make on the next, next slide, that a thermal chronological date need not and usually does not record a specific event or even the time at which the closure isotherm was crossed. So it actually records sort of an integrated uh, history. This in some ways sort of gets back to the question that was asked earlier about, you know, what do you do to the diffusion profile if you're sort of, you know, if you don't have a single event, if you sort of have a more complicated history, and this is sort of an example of that. Okay, so for example, here's a plot again of temperature versus time. Now, once again, I've switched my axes on you, but here we're going from high temperatures to low temperatures. So we can either sit isothermally for 100 million years at 60 degrees C. That would give you a 15 million year helium date. Okay, just because of the way in which helium is partly being retained and partly lost from the crystal. Or you could have continuous partial cooling um, recently, and that too would yield a helium date of 15 million years. So in order to figure out exactly what your helium date means, you need to bring additional information to bear on the problem. You need geological constraints, um, and um, people use different strategies to try to figure this out. So one approach that people use, and I'm sort of covering this in part because some of you guys have, may have heard of this, this idea of using vertical profiles. So um, commonly what people do to try to figure out what's going on is to acquire vertical profiles through a section of rocks. Okay? And so part of this is because obviously, I mean, if you have multiple dates and you can over a vertical section, you can more fig precisely figure out, well, what's the thermal history that must have been experienced by the entire section of rock? So um, this is just a, a, a photograph of the northern um, White Mountains, and this is an area that has undergone normal faulting. And so uh, one of the sort of classic early studies that was published by Danny Stockley, this is just, to, again, to give you an idea of sort of how people think about these helium data. Okay, so this is a, um, an example of a, an extensional setting. So here we're looking at a cross-section through the crust. So again, we have temperatures increasing with depth. We have this sort of helium partial retention zone, which is here. There's additional information about fission track stuff plotted on here, but um, here's our helium partial retention zone. And here's our um, zone of rocks that will ultimately be exposed at the surface. Okay, so when they're sitting down here in this range, they're um, sort of accumulating helium. Then we have this sudden event of normal faulting. You tilt your fault blocks, you bring these rocks to the surface, you have this sudden cooling event. Okay, and so now you can go out, go out here and you can sample a vertical profile of rocks, which is what Danny did. And so here's a plot that's sort of uh, analogous to the one I showed you of the helium partial retention zone. So here's a plot of, of apparent age or date versus depth below the Cretaceous unconformity. So it's essentially depth below this surface. And what you can see here, what you should look at is this profile. And what you can see is that this profile looks like the helium partial retention zone that I showed you on the previous slide. Okay, so we have this curve up here, we have this region, and then this zone here. And so essentially what you're looking at here is this is a profile that developed while the rocks were sitting here in the crust. Then you tilted it, cooled everything quickly, and you just brought them up to the surface and you preserved this partial retention zone. Okay, so that, so this sort of, uh, so this uh, tells us that we have rapid exhumation at a certain time when we bring this profile up to the surface. So people are sort of commonly doing these sort of vertical profiles to try to either seek out these partial retention zones or try to figure out when, when does cooling occur within this section of rock. Are there questions? Yes. Down here, yeah. Yeah, there's actually a, a younger timing of faulting that they infer from the data. And that would have been initially uh, the development, a little bit of helium accumulation and then a, a second phase of faulting. Yeah. This is the time, so this is the time when you have the major faulting event. So you've, you've had this partial retention zone develop, you bring the rocks up to the surface suddenly at some time, and then since then you've been accumulating helium um, and recording that 15 million year date. And then there's a little bit more complexity at the bottom. Yes? When you say rapid to a group of scientists, what, what does that work out in strain rate or millimeters per year? Hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. I don't think it went from A to B instantaneously. No, you're right. Yeah. I mean, I don't usually think in rates like that. Because um, I often find, I don't know, different time scales of rates to be depending on how you report numbers, slightly 
misleading potentially. But I mean, this sort of faulting event, I think you know that might happen over a million years, two million year time frame. And that would be rapid. I would consider that rapid. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, that's just to give you a little idea of sort of how to think about these helium dates. That, you know, when you see a helium date, it doesn't necessarily represent simple cooling at a certain time. That's the main point here. Okay. So um, just to, to give a few examples of other ways in you know, which people have applied appetite euthorium helium work. So another classic early study that was published in 1998 by uh, Martha House and um, Brian Wernicke and Ken Farley was a study trying to decipher the timing of development of major paleo canyons in the Sierra Nevada. And so, um, you know, they're asking the questions, when do these major paleo canyons form? And in this case, they actually sampled horizontally and used some information about the deflection of isotherms to infer that these canyons um, um, formed in the Cretaceous. These canyons are really old, implying really ancient topography there. And then, um, increasingly, people are, um, you know, applying this sort of... Uh, methodology to a whole range of problems. This is an example of a glaciated region in the Coast Mountains. This is published by Todd Ehlers and Ken Farley back in 2003. And um, this is just showing, for example, this is the topography at the surface and the thermal field at depth. And they were using euthorium helium thermochronology to try to figure out uh, when this glacial valley formed and at what rate and why, and trying to relate that to um, thermal field evolution at depth. And increasingly, there's a, a whole lot of work that's being done, for example, to develop thermokinematic models to um, better decipher the significance of helium dates over um, regions of the crust. So um, sort of I would say the, the development of the thermochronometers um, is proceeding at, I think, a pretty rapid rate in terms of our understanding of diffusion kinetics and the range of applications. And then there's also this sort of you know, a parallel field in which people are using these increasingly sophisticated models to try to understand the different processes that might lead to the dates that we see. All right, so the last little piece that I'm going to write, two more little pieces that I'm going to mention here, just to say that um, so uh, there can also be some additional, a little bit of additional complexity in um, the diffusion kinetics. And this is something that we recently recognized in the appetite euthorium helium system. And the reason that I mention this is that um, this is actually, our understanding of this process is actually, was enormously important in our, in our ability to apply this tool to cratonic regions. So in the early days, you know, like 20 years ago, when people first started applying the system, they were applying it to places like the basin and range, which have these rapid cooling histories, right? Um, and so they were places that were really, you know, uh, rocketing up to the surface. And they were finding uniform dates. And they were like, wow, look, the system works awesome. Then people started working in, in thermal regimes that were a bit more complicated. And they found that in areas with very protracted cooling that they didn't always get reproducible dates. So sometimes they'd see a lot of scatter. <laughs> that didn't make sense. And um, they sometimes yielded dates that were older than expected based, for example, on other geologic constraints or appetite fission track data in the same region. And it turns out that actually in cratonic regions, cratonic regions became sort of a special <laughs> focus of like a huge amount of debate because the fission track, track data and the helium data didn't agree and people were very upset with each other about whose system was wrong. <laughs> so... Um, but it turns out that I think now we actually understand a lot of the source of dispersion in these samples. So when Ken first published his paper back in 2000 on the helium diffusion kinetics of appetite, he carried out a few diffusion experiments, and he concluded that it looked like, you know, we have a sort of a, a uniform diffusion kinetic uh, sort of property for different appetites. We don't actually know that's not true. So David Schuster... Um, uh, acquired subsequently a whole large suite of helium diffusion data for appetites from all over the place. Okay? And so he did these step heating experiments and determined the helium diffusion kinetic parameters, and then from that calculated a closure temperature. And so here's a plot of the inferred closure temperature for these appetites versus the helium concentration in them. And so each one of these points represents the results of a separate diffusion experiment. And so what you see here is that there is this broad positive correlation between closure temperature and the helium concentration. And what we now know, based on a variety of additional work, that this helium concentration is, in fact, a proxy for radiation damage. Okay, so 
The interesting thing now about the helium system is that the closure temperature of the helium system is not fixed through time. It actually evolves through time with the accumulation and annealing of radiation damage in the aptite crystal. Okay, so for example, as you, uh, so as you accumulate more damage over time, your appetite becomes more retentive. And so um, we've, uh, so there's actually a lot of subsequent work that I think pretty clearly demonstrates that it's radiation damage that's controlling this pattern. We have a new, now have a new helium diffusion kinetic model um, that incorporates the effects of radiation damage and annealing in um, our understanding of, in, our, in interpreting euthorium helium dates. Yes? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so I know. Yeah. So initially, it's a little bit like counterintuitive because, you know, when you think of zircon, for example, in the uranium lead system, you think, well, when zircons get really, really radiation damage, they get leaky, and so uh, they diffusively lose their helium. So in this case, what we think is going on is that really low levels of damage that you get these little pockets of isolated damage, so that you end up sort of getting a two-phase system, so that it's harder for the helium to sort of escape from this damage pocket from this trap than it is to diffuse through the matrix. And so as you accumulate damage, you get more and more of these retentive domains. And so uh, this is like, you know, we quantitatively characterize this as a different activation energy for the damaged pockets versus that in the matrix. And then that proportion is changing over time. And then you can anneal out the damage and sort of return to ground state. And so one would expect that at really extreme levels of damage that you might see the same thing that you see in zircon, that the damage would become interconnected and that you would have rapid loss. And actually in zircon, some new work that one of Pete Reiner's students is doing, they actually see what they think is that full progression. They see an increase in retentivity at first, and then they see the reduction. Um, so, yeah. So that's, our, that's what we think is going on. And it seems to work. Uh, I mean, the, the diffusion experiments very clearly say that there is an increase. And like, so Ken and David have now taken appetites and they've put additional damage in them and seen the retentivity go up. And then they've annealed the appetites and they've seen their um, retentivity go down. And then also in this model, it predicts very specific diagnostic correlations between date and uranium concentration. I don't need to get into this in a lot of detail, but like, <laughs> so this is your uranium concentration of your appetite versus your euthorium helium date. And so these are real data that I have from the Colorado Plateau, which is where I got all involved in this business because I started seeing a lot of dispersion in my data and then I started plotting them up and I was like, hmm, why am I getting these correlations with uranium concentration? And this is when David and I put two and two together and we were like, aha, <laughs> your model explains my data. <laughs> so at any rate, these, this model predicts these diagnostic correlations between date and uranium concentration that I don't need to go into right now. I think it's a little more complicated than what we need to get into, but um, I see these correlations in you now a lot of my data set. And these correlations are very sensitive to the thermal history. These correlations develop in places where you have protracted cooling, like in cratonic settings. Um, and really, as a consequence of this effect, we're actually, this is a really, I think, powerful way to extract additional details about the time temperature pass, because you're essentially sort of dealing with a multi-kinetic system. Yeah. That's a very good question, yeah. Well, so zircon definitely sees it for the helium system. The zircon definitely does. Like I was saying, Reiner's, he definitely sees it. And it's long, yeah, so definitely zircon. I don't, uh, monazite, I, there's been a little bit of work that's been done on monazite. I don't think they, they see that because the damage, like, anneals out instantaneously for some reason. I don't know why that is, but, like, monazite doesn't accumulate damage for the helium system. Um, and, well, and, yeah, it doesn't accumulate damage anyways because it never undergoes healing, you know, lead loss even. And then um, for, the other, for the other minerals, I don't know. It seems like you might expect this to be an effect. Um, certainly makes me wonder about other systems like the uranium lead system, you know, where, you know, some of these other minerals where you can't do simple diffusion experiments with gases. You know, we just have, it's, it seems, my perception is it's much more difficult to do these diffusion experiments. So it seems to me there could be some additional controls on the closure temperature and other the, uh, some of these other sim systems that we simply don't know about. So it seems like it could be in other minerals that we haven't identified in yet. Yes? Uh, 
So our, uh, we favor it being alpha damage rather than the fission track damage because the fission tracks damage happens relatively rarely and there are these huge black tracks that are blasted through the system. And so consequently, because the um, alpha damage happens much more frequently, um, we, well, we favor, we favor the alpha particle damage as being the cause. And so in calibrating our model, we sort of used the fission track density as a proxy for alpha damage. But in the end, we assume, we assume it's alpha damage. So there could be additional work to actually confirm that. There's actually a lot of, not a lot of studies to try to understand how, well, for example, does alpha damage accumulate in the same way that fission track damage does in crystals? But we think it's alpha damage is the bottom line. <laughs> Did you have a question? Yeah, no, uh, what you were mentioning about the refracted history. Yeah. Or this, what can you give a scale for that? I mean, time scale? What do you mean? So, I mean, like, uh, okay, here's an example. I was going to use this as an example of how we simulate helium data. So, this is a, um, so here's a, a time temperature plot, and these are this is a thermal history result for samples from the bottom of the Grand Canyon, okay? And so uh, here we go from 120 degrees C down to zero degrees C. And so, um, you know, for, for a rapid cooling history, what I would mean is that you might have a thermal history that comes across like this and goes bam, or, you know, has a much steeper curve, whereas this is what I would call a protracted cooling history. And what I mean by protracted is that it's sort of moving... Uh, slowly, I don't know, I should probably quantify this better for you, but um, through this helium partial retention zone. So essentially as it's moving through this zone, again, you have this opportunity for the helium to be partly retained and partially lost from the crystal. But so essentially when you have apatites with different uranium concentrations, they're accumulating damage at different rates. So their helium retentivities start to diverge because the higher uranium ones are accumulating damage faster and therefore their closure temperature increases more rapidly than the lower uranium ones. And so if you have a protracted cooling history like this, you allow the damage to accumulate when you're in this regime of partial retention. So these, so the high uranium guys are re starting to retain the damage and get more higher, have a higher closure temperatures where the lower ones aren't. And so in this case, sometimes you get your data to spread out because essentially you develop a system in which your appetites have different closure temperatures. So then when you cool them, they have different dates. Other, other questions? Okay. Yeah, I mainly wanted to get into this just to, to say, so... Uh, this new model is really very important for our ability to apply this method now in cratonic interiors. In the past, people haven't really applied helium in cratonic interiors because of these problems. And now I think we understand the source of a lot of these problems. And I see these same data U correlations in a lot of cratonic samples. And so our, this new model allows us to actually, I think, um, accurately interpret data from cratonic regions. All right, so it's just going to briefly touch on sort of yeah, the idea of how we, how we do these thermal history simulations in terms of uh, what we're generally trying to do is, you know, we're not able to obtain a unique thermal history. What we're trying to do is constrain fields of viable thermal histories. Again, because we sort of have this regime of partial helium retention and impartial loss, you know, oftentimes there's a variety of thermal histories that can constrain, that, that would fit your date, okay? So, you know, when you do thermal chronology, what you're really trying to do is you're, you want to bring as many other geological constraints into the picture as possible to integrate that with their helium data so you can more precisely constrain what your thermal history can viably be doing. So this is an example, again, from the bottom of the Grand Canyon. And here's this particular example just has, happens to have this correlation between date and uranium concentration. Again, this is an a, a expected consequence of this new radiation, of this radiation damage effect. But essentially, so what we would do, so from the bottom of the Grand Canyon, I know some things at the outset about the thermal history that this rock experienced, okay? So here's our time temperature plot. So I know, for example, based on independent appetite fission track data, this other thermal chronometer, which is sensitive to higher temperatures, that these rocks were at temperatures of 120 degrees C or higher 80 million years ago. So I know that. So I say, okay, I'm going to put that as a constraint on my thermal history. I know these rocks are at the surface today. So I force my thermal history through there. So now I can carry out an inverse modeling. 
to try to determine the thermal histories that can reproduce my data. So essentially, um, we use this helium production diffusion model in which the helium diffusivity depends both on temperature and now in this new model on the radiation damage that's accumulated in the crystal. And so essentially, what I do in terms of the thermal history simulation results that I'll be showing you is I then simulate, you know, to use a Monte Carlo approach. This uses the hefty computer modeling program of, uh, Rick, um, of Rich Ketchum. Um, at UT Austin. And so um, his program, you know, you can simulate, you know, let's say 10,000 or 50,000 random time temperature paths, and all those time temperature paths are forced to go through these two points. And then I compare the predicted dates from those thermal histories with the real dates of my samples, the real grain size, the real effective uranium concentration of my samples, and uh, if we have good fits, then we consider them viable histories. And so, of course, he has a statistical approach for determining the good goodness of fits of these parameters. And so in this case, and in many of the plots that I'll be showing you, I'll be showing you the results of, as fields of viable histories, okay? So uh, the light gray are what he considers acceptable fit histories, the dark gray are good fit histories, and the black line is the best fit history. You should not place too much uh, sort of weighting on the best fit history. But in this case, for example, the best fit history predicts the date EU correlation that's observed in this sample. So what you should think of is this, this sort of this gray region represents the range of viable thermal histories. Now, the thermal history can't necessarily hit anywhere within this regime. There are certain, um, I actually should have shown you the individual time temperature paths as well. But again, commonly what we're trying to do in thermochronology, we're not ever, in most cases, aren't able to determine a single time temperature path. We're just trying to place constraints on the fields of viable histories. And so this is what we've done here. In other cases, so this is an example of a simple cooling history. But in other cases, of course, we can also con consider burial and cooling history. So some of the time temperature plots that, I, plots that I'll be showing you in a little bit, it, it includes both heating. So we might have a, a history where we have heating and then cooling. But the, it works, the idea is the same for both. Questions? Any questions? Yes. Yeah, so. And is that no, yeah, so, yeah, so right now this is just a function of how the modeling was done. And so in this particular modeling program, you can allow like a set number of breaks in your time temperature pass. And um, so in this case, I think it allowed it to break, you know, several times. And so it makes it look choppy like this. So you should not place too much weighting on those breaks. Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, you have this cooling event in the Laramide, and then something that happens more recently. I mean, I think a lot of the, some of the uplift happened in the <laughs> Laramide, so yeah. Yeah, I mean, we'll get to Colorado Plateau stuff this afternoon. This is just a particular example. Yeah. Um, so if you didn't include the, uh, this new diffusivity of varying with the uh, heating concentration, just, just so I could calibrate this, what, what would the lines look like for the temperature histories? Would they like fundamentally different? Well, you could not explain these data, I guess. So without this new radiation damage model, so, you know, pretty much all other thermochronometers, right? I mean, we assume... assume uniform diffusion kinetics over time. And so uh, without the new radiation damage model, we would expect that all the, so here I've got my date versus uranium concentration, and I've got younger dates for the low uranium appetites and older ones for the high uranium appetites. With the old model, you would never predict something like that. You would always, for the same thermal history, expect uniform dates regardless of uranium concentration. So you could not explain these data. You'd be like, uh, why am I getting this scatter? <laughs> Only now we understand the scatter. So. so we just wouldn't understand the system. We wouldn't know how to explain the data. Other questions? OK. Hmm. So I have 20 minutes left. I have to decide what to do here. 
Uh, okay, well, so what I was going to do next is just to give you some, uh, a couple examples, but maybe I'll just I'll, um, do sort of a short example of some of the work we've been doing in the North American cratonic interior. Um, so, so, you know, so how uh, sort of deep-seated processes control the sort of elevation change and topographic evolution of continents is a, a first-order question, continental dynamics. And although, you know, I think we have a first-order understanding of the causes of those processes when you're, like, close to plate boundaries, there is pretty much no consensus on the mechanisms responsible for elevation change when you go to the middle of continents, like in the middle of North America. And, you know, in, um, there, are, there are places in continental interiors where sort of these cryptic so-called like epiurogenic motions have really long puzzled geologists. When you're far from plate boundaries, how do you undergo elevation change? And so there um, are a few places that my group's been working recently to try to uh, address some of these problems using, using these advances in euthorium helium thermochronology. And so, for example, um, the North American cratonic interior um, in interesting, is interesting in that, in that there's Again, there are some thick packages of Phanerozoic sedimentary rocks that we know um, occur in the interior of North America, and um, people have suggested in the past that maybe, you know, maybe the North American cratonic interior is actually bobbing up and down through time. It turns out with this new euthorium helium work, we're actually able to pretty well constrain the burial and unroofing, and in some cases the vertical motion history of what this continental interior is doing, which is very interesting because then you can ask, well, why is it doing that? Um, so the Southern African Plateau, of course, is very interesting. It uh, architecturally is a lot like the Canadian Shield in that it's cored by Archean cratons and surrounded by Proterozoic mobile belts. But unlike the Canadian Shield, it's now sitting at a kilometer in elevation. <laughs> and um, also, unlike all of the other major continental plateaus on Earth that were in some sort of a contractional plate setting when they underwent elevation gain, Southern Africa was completely surrounded by extensional plate boundaries when it went up. Um, and it's underlain by this African superplume that geodynamicists are very interested in. So Africa is very interesting for a whole variety um, of reasons. And then the Colorado Plateau, we'll talk about that uh, this afternoon. Um, so uh, the Colorado Plateau for um, about 500 million years, that region was part of the stable North American craton, just happily sitting at sea level. And then sometime after 80 million years ago, it went up to its two kilometers um, to its current mean elevation of two kilometers, while it was over a thousand kilometers inboard from a plate boundary. And so there is um, a lot of controversy over when the plateau went up and why. And so what all of these areas um, have in common is that they're all underlain by rocks that are Proterozoic or Archean in age. They're all in settings that are located far from plate margins, and in all cases there's controversy over the timing and the causes of elevation change. So... I first just wanted to introduce this very important distinction between unroofing and uplift. Callan might pick up on this a little bit more, but I'm just going to do this in this one slide because this is a very important distinction. Unroofing and uplift are not the same. So unroofing is the thickness of rock removed through erosion or tectonism, and this can occur at sea level in some cases. So here's just our little sort of time series. So we have Precambrian basement, overlying section, and we can, you know, erosionally remove the strata. And so thermochronology, now we can obtain really, really excellent resolution of these unroofing histories. Really, I mean, some really amazing revolution, um, resolution of both the spatial and temporal patterns of unroofing. But thermochronology is not a direct proxy for surface uplift. So surface uplift is elevation gain of the Earth's surface. And paleo elevation, past elevation of topography is extremely difficult to constrain because there's no direct reliable proxy for it. And so this is why in mountain belts all over the world, people debate ad nauseum about when the Himalayas and when the Andes went up and when everywhere went up because we can't directly constrain paleo elevation. So thermochronology, by constraining unroofing history, sometimes can indirectly get at paleo elevation because as you might expect, sometimes you have surface uplift and that can cause unroofing but that is not necessarily the case. So there's an additional step to go from thermochronology data to an unroofing history, and then there's an additional interpretational step to go to uplift and elevation change. So that's always an important thing to keep in mind. So throughout this talk, I'll always you know, be making a very clear distinction between unroofing and then trying to decipher elevation change. And this is why it's so complicated in the Colorado Plateau, because we don't know when it went up. 
Um, wait, when the base, what, sorry? Well, what you're showing there on the figure is the pre-cambered base is coming up four kilometers, right? Um, well, I guess what I would say is that, um, I guess I would say two things to that. First of all, I mean, I can imagine situations, for example, Colorado Plateau might be a good example, where there might be a delay between when you have surface uplift and when you're, you denude a large region just based on the integration of river systems. For example, you know, the Colorado Plateau. There you get major denudation of the plateau interior after six. I would argue that that could be a complete, con completely a consequence of that's when you integrate the Colorado River. So suddenly you have this emission efficient mechanism to suck material off the plateau. Maybe the plateau actually went up much earlier. That's a possibility. You know, I, like, I like separating these two concepts. Yeah. Oh, wait, wait, uh, has gone up by four, you mean, to, what, what do you mean? You mean from down here and state, oh, here? Oh, oh, well, here, I mean, you can think of this as being rock uplift. So that's another term, like, you know, Peter Molnar's classic paper talking about rock uplift versus surface uplift. So this is like rocks moving closer to the surface. So there are, I mean. Um, uh, possibly. I don't know. Maybe Kellen will get to this a little bit more in his talk. I think, I mean, I, I, I think there's some uh, potentially more complicated relationships. So I think, I, I mean, I just mainly want to say cautionarily, like, we should not use thermochronology as a perfect proxy for uplift because there are situations where things could be much more complicated than that. That's right. Mm hmm. Well, I mean, yeah. I mean, you know, you see unconformities in sedimentary sections all the time, <laughs> right? I mean, they're all over the place. So, I mean, clearly you can erode stuff while you're still at sea level or close to sea level. And one of the things that you can predict with an uplift is there will be erosion. There's no way that an uplift can happen without erosion. Uh, well, no. I mean, you could have surface uplift, and, but no. I mean, to get erosion, what you need is some means to remove the material. So again, in the case of the Colorado Plateau, I mean, you could, you could potentially, so it's a matter of what's the time lag, I guess, between when uplift happens and when the erosion happens. So if you don't have a drainage system that allows you to remove that material, then you could have uplift and you could have it sit there for a while before you get denudation. So potentially the relationships are more complicated than this. And hopefully, I mean, Kellen will probably touch on this. Yeah. For places like the Colorado Plateau, I mean, there's some oil wells that have been drilled two, three, four kilometers deep. And mm -hmm. quite a lot of them deep in it. And have we, or have you guys compared sort of some of those temperature gradients to what the MDT, or the temperature super suggested from that? The MDT, sorry. So there's, I'm trying to remember what MDT stands for, but there's a, there's a wire line log tool, and they mm. call it. Yeah. So yeah. So you're just pointing out that there may be temperature core information on the Colorado Plateau that you could incorporate into interpreting the thermochronology data. Yeah. I think that's your point. Yeah. yeah. Could be. I'm. Uh, I don't know if there are any of those drill cores down on the southern plateau where I have all my data, but yeah. Anyway, yeah, yeah, I mean, you certainly want to incorporate that as much information like that into your thermal history interpretation as possible. So, I mean, that's, that's a good point. Hmm. All right, well, I have 10 minutes, so. <laughs> Uh, so I'm just going to, in those 10 minutes, tell you very briefly about this work that we've been doing up in the Canadian Shield and sort of uh, 
uh, Shiji showed a slide that just sort of showed our sort of the, the final result. <laughs> and I'm just going to try to uh, very quickly show you how we got there. Okay. So, uh, so here's a, a plot of the interior of North America. And uh, I mean, so we all know cratons are the most stable portions of continents. But uh, I think some of the things that we've, you know, I mean, just how stable are they? <laughs> and um, so, uh, how do I want to compress here? Yeah, so I guess mainly I should just set up the problem here. So, you know, uh, I should just slide at the beginning of the talk of the exposure of lower crustal rocks that are, are, are sitting here, right? And so this is, so the pink is exposed Precambrian basement. So Archean cratons and Proterozoic belts. Um, and uh, back when I did my work on some of these exposed basement rocks, you know, I just had sort of assumed that those rocks were pretty much just sat at the surface since 1.7 billion years ago at the end of my whole exhumation story, and that was that. And there wasn't really anything else interesting <laughs> that happened after that time. But it turns out the tail end of my PhD, I went up there and I got some uh, helium data for some of these samples, and I started pulling some phanerozoic helium dates out of those rocks. And I was like, well, what is going on with here? Like, why am I getting phanerozoic helium dates? Why are these not proterozoic? And I started looking around, and I realized there's actually fission track data that had been acquired, not in the Western Canadian Shield, but over in some of these regions, and those were all phanerozoic. And then I started sort of getting into some of this old, older literature by Jerry Bond and such. And these, he had talked a lot about the hypsometric history of the North American cratonic interior and had sort of been suggesting, well, maybe the craton's kind of like bobbing up and down over time, in which case you're like, you know, why is it doing that? And then, of course, there's this whole, all this new mantle dynamic work that's being done that um, possibly could provide a mechanism to explain the vertical motions in these continental interiors. Because here, I mean, you're so far from the plate boundaries that, you know, what sort of it's hard to invoke tectonics to explain some of these motions. So, um, you know, it seemed like, well, there's this sort of interesting possibility. Well, maybe mantle dynamics provides an, a, a way to explain these otherwise uh, potentially inexplicable histories within um, continental interiors. And so um, yesterday, um, Shiji put up a slide talking about the, uh, the Cretaceous interior seaway, which is represented by these green units here. However, those, uh, and, you know, it, um, pointed out that a variety of geodynamicists have, you know, demonstrated that you could potentially explain the deposition and subsequent uplift and tilting of those units with uh, these mantle dynamic models. However, those Cretaceous units are, in fact, part of a much thicker package of Phanerozoic sedimentary rocks, Paleozoic units that are shown here in blue. And there, in fact, has been a longstanding controversy over whether the deposition of these units can be explained by eustatic sea level change alone or whether you require some sort of vertical motion of the continent to explain their deposition. And so um, mantle uh, dynamic studies have heavily relied on the preserved stratigraphic record to calibrate their models. For example, again, these deposits, indicative of the location of the western interior seaway, but an intrinsic limitation of that approach is that that record is incomplete. So if dynamic topography is ephemeral, you would expect that units that are deposited during a uh, sort of ephemeral phase of mantle subsidence might be denuded during a subsequent phase of uplift. And so um, our approach is to use low temperature thermochronometry as a means at getting at those missing pieces of the stratigraphic record because we can use euthorium helium and appetite fission track to resolve these shallow depositional and erosional episodes even when the rocks associated with those episodes have now been completely denuded from the rock record. So now I'm just going to uh, zoom in to a simplified geologic map of the Western Canadian Shield. And so, again, so this shows um, the Precambrian basement, which is overlined by the blue or Paleozoic units that unconformably overlie the craton, and green are Cretaceous units. And so um, I had initially obtained these Phanerozoic dates down here, but it turns out that the slave craton is really interesting, and it's got all these kimberlites that have pierced the craton, but these kimberlites contain class of Devonian uh, marine strata and Cretaceous um, sedimentary rocks um, that although the slate craton right now is completely devoid of sedimentary cover, that provides you know, irrefutable evidence that those units once covered the craton. And so our objectives were to go out here and use low temperature thermochronometry and integrate it with some of those constraints to resolve the spatial extent, thickness, and history of these cryptic Phanerozoic burial and roofing episodes that affected the continental interior um, to, um, and to think about the causes. 
And so um, my PhD student, Alexis Alt, she did much of the, the work um, all across the, the slave craton. I guess just to, um, yeah, I guess I think I'll just show you our model in the end. So we now have data across uh, much of the Canadian shield, or much of the Western Canadian shield. All the dates are Phanerozoic. If you combine those Phanerozoic helium dates with a variety of other geologic constraints, pretty much the data require an overall pattern of substantial heating and then cooling in Paleozoic to early Mesozoic time. So here I'm just showing a plot of temperature versus time. There are these fields of thermal histories. So we have this pattern of heating and then cooling. Pretty much the only way to explain this pattern is to have um, substantial burial of the craton followed by enroofing in Paleozoic, Mesozoic time. We think uh, based on the preserved remnants across the craton, uh, we think that uh, these uh, units that are now denuded away were almost certainly marine in origin. And so I think the, the significant implication of this is that these data imply that the entire Western Canadian shield was inundated and buried by sedimentary rocks in Paleozoic time, that those rocks were later eroded away. And um, I'm just going to quickly show you sort of our model for how this ties in with, um, uh, so we sort of in, in the slave craton, we have all of these additional constraints from the kimberlites based on their erosion levels, based on the xenoliths that they constrain, and so we can, that they contain, and so we can combine the thermochronology results with this geologic information, and we have this very pretty detailed history of burial and unroofing of the slave craton. So we have these different snapshots 450 million years ago. We have some onset of burial. We have substantial burial that happens in the Devonian based on our thermochronology data. We denude stuff. We put a bunch of Cretaceous back on while we're at sea level because there are marine xenoliths and the Kimberlites. We denude that. We put a little bit of tertiary stuff on. And then we get to the present day when we take everything off. And we have actually a very pretty high degree of confidence in this history based on both the thermochronology data and the kimberlites. And so although the slave craton, you know, right now, it's got pretty much nothing on it, it has not been like that for most of its history. It's actually had a pretty dynamic history of burial and roofing and elevation change. And so, uh, yeah, there are actually some interesting implications for kimberlites. But we're not. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Those Yeah. They are, yeah, so before I was showing them as fields. So these are individual time temperature paths that um, viably explain the data. Yeah. So there are these broad fields. So, you know, I can't tell you exactly what happened, but I can tell you overall that there was this burial and unroofing pattern, and so which requires, well, this heating and cooling pattern, which requires several kilometers of burial and unroofing. And that's sort of as far as I'm willing to go with the interpretation because we can't better resolve that at the moment. Yeah, so this is where I uh, started working a bit with Shiji because there's, you know, a limited number of mechanisms that can, can explain this broad-scale inundation and burial and then followed by unroofing of the continent. So we can do this by long-term sea level rise and fall or subsidence followed by uplift of the craton. So what I can tell you is that it's not sea level change because if, if you compare the um, eustatic curves with our model, they are, like, opposite in trend. So that's not the cause. It's probably not tectonics because you're so far from the plate boundary. So what we did, and, and Shiji showed these results yesterday, so I'll just cut to the chase here. We actually, I mean, we didn't, like, we essentially took Shiji's model. He made some predictions for the evolution of dynamic topography in the slave craton during the assembly and breakup of the supercontinent of Pangaea. And so essentially, the way I, th I think of this, at least, is that you assemble Pangaea, you stick a bunch of cold slabs down on the mantle, and you sort of suck down the continent. Then you start to break things up, and you have return flow and mantle upwellings, and as a consequence, you get surface uplift. And so, um, so if we looked at the predicted vertical motion from his models, it looks something like this. So that's the predicted um, elevation change. And if you compare that with our barrel and unroofing history, to first order, we feel like, wow, that's not a bad match. So I think the most important thing is that you can see that the shift from burial to unroofing in the slave craton actually matches to first order with the shift from subsidence to uplift um, in the dynamic model predictions. And also, this is the kind of history would predict exactly what we see, that sediments that were deposited are later already. Yes. Oh, yeah, 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 yes, yeah. 
So I, so, um, so I do not want to place too much emphasis on the overall magnitudes, because I think that's the thing that we know least well. So I think in this particular plot, I use 20 degrees C per kilometer. In slave now, I now appreciate the fact that actually the geotherms could have been much higher than that just because of high heat production. And I guess if you put this package of strata over it, I mean, maybe the geotherms were as high as 30. So I don't want to overly emphasize the exact magnitudes, but there's enough heating and cooling that you have to have a couple kilometers. You have what? Yeah, I think most of the modern, the most of the modern, yeah. So I guess, yeah, so most of the modern geotherms are on the order of 20 degrees C, I think, 20 to 25 degrees C. Is that true? I guess you would know. Okay. Here? Oh, yeah, this is millions of years ago. So this shift, so this is happening sort of in the, uh, what is that, sort of 300 million year time frame? The continent broke up around 150 million years ago, right? Not up there. Not up there. Oh, that's what I'm wondering, what, what was the date there? Uh, in terms of continental breakup? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's older in this region. I can't tell you exactly. I mean, we're talking about, I mean, Shiji, okay. I'm well, going to call on you. Okay. Yeah. So um, I think my time's essentially up. So at any rate, from this, uh, all we do is it, we're just saying it looks like you know dynamic topography. This is a, a plausible first order cause of the long wavelength elevation change across this region. We're not necessarily saying this model is right. We're saying this is a plausible cause. And not only that, maybe we can actually begin to use some of these thermochronology data to begin to test and calibrate some of these mantle dynamic models. Um, yeah, Khaled. Yeah, just a quick question, because um, obviously the timing is emphasizing the same because the axes are completely different, right? One kilometer dynamic predicted. Yeah, yeah. Five kilometers very often. But on the other hand, it seems to me like there would always be a positive feedback. If you create a one kilometer deep hole, you can fill up the kilometer sediment, so it's going to sink, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree with that. Maybe that was your point. But yeah, yeah, that there could be a positive feedback effect. So you wouldn't yeah, necessarily expect those numbers to be comparable. Yeah, that's a good point. Yes? I would think no, but I will let Chiji. Yeah, yeah, I'm ready to be done. I'm just answering questions, so I'm, yeah. yeah. Uh, at the same time, I think uh, basically what you're doing here is uh, the continent floating over some large-scale temperature anomalies in the mantle, etc. But uh, the one thing that you do see in the continent is something more than this. It's just not uh, a straight substance which is uniform across the whole continent. You have several big sedimentary basin depot centers forming. So uh, I think uh, you have to account for those. This, this idea that you do have indeed uh, changes in the mantle temperature and dynamics is fine, but this does not account for these basins. And this is why I, I think the model that I presented Tuesday is a better explanation. So you should uh, uh, entertain the possibility that it's the content itself that does the trick. Because huh. it will produce these depot centers, it will produce these localized uh, uh, enhanced subsidence which the general dynamic model will not produce. Uh, so back in 
going back to your thesis work, everything that's happened since then, you have this really cool story of the really lowest temperature uh, thermal chronometers. But if you go and look at the more intermediate temperature ones, are they really completely just shut off and show no record of this whatsoever with this new view? Well, so the lowest temperature that I went, so essentially for the previous work, I have a really detailed temperature history from like, you know, 1,000 degrees C down to about 300 through the end of argon. And to me, actually, what's really interesting is to think about, and so at the end of the, so the argon dates, the mica dates, pretty much all across the Canadian Shield. They're like Proterozoic, right? Nothing younger than that. And we're picking this up in the Phanerozoic. So to me, what's really interesting is what's going on in between there. And I think, I don't know, I'm really interested in applying some of these intermediate temperature thermochronometers to figure out what's going on, because there's this big time gap. And, you know, the, most of the thermochronometers that have been conventionally applied, they don't allow you to see into that time gap. So I actually think that's a really interesting place that I'm planning to start acquiring some data for soon. <laughs> um, in a lot of these basins, you get extensional features first. In other words, you get aborted rift systems that evolve into basins. Thus, you have to have extension to start these basins out. Do you have any evidence for that in your models? No. So how no. do you explain that? How do I explain what, the substance? No, the extension in the early phases of the basin development. So, I guess... Yeah. No, well, some of them do. Some of them do, yeah. I think. Yeah, I mean, I'm thinking of like the whole, I mean, essentially like the whole continent's going down and the whole continent's coming back up. I mean, maybe you sort of modulate my view a little bit with what Claude presented in terms of maybe there's some more local things going on, but it's a big regional thing. It's not a... Oh, yeah. <laughs> Anyway, I know it's coffee time, so I feel like I went over my time. So, um, well, are there any students want to ask questions? We'll just run a few more minutes. Uh, I have a more general question about the isotopic system, focused specifically on thorium. Uh, to date the zircon. Uh, we cannot analyze the thorium as the uranium thorium lead system. You just miss the point of the thorium, so the triple, this triple system have are missing one point of that. I, I know that the geochronologists don't like to talk about this, but in this uranium thorium helium system, it's it's very similar than. Is very important the thorium content on that. How you analyze and how you deal with this? Oh, so we yeah we analyze both uranium and thorium, and we do that by ICPMS. I mean because it's a little bit. So the uranium lead system is distinct in some ways from the euthorium helium system, and that the euthorium helium system so 238 uranium, 235 uranium, 232 thorium they all generate helium four. So what we want to know is how much helium four and how much uranium and thorium we have. In the uranium lead system, 238 and 235 decay to different isotopes of lead, and thorium decays to yet a different isotope. So you essentially, in the uranium lead system, have these two different systems that you can use to evaluate concordancy and everything. Whereas in the euthorium helium system, you really don't have that. So, I mean, the thorium uranium thorium analysis is actually very straightforward. We just dissolve the mineral, we spike it and then we run it by ICPMS, solution ICPMS. It's a very straightforward analysis. I was wondering if you had any thoughts on the um, closure temperature of uranium, lead, and rutile. There seems to be a, a pretty large spread in the closure temperature that people, there's, it's like people are basically competing between, well, it's 500 or it's 300, which is a pretty big difference. Uranium, lead, and rutile? Yeah. Um, you know, I have not followed that debate so recently. I do recall that at least like, you know, 
five years ago or something, there was a big discrepancy between the experimental constraints, which were quite high, yeah, exactly. and the observed, like, you know, what you actually seem to see in the system. I mean, my inclination is to believe the, the actual geochronology data and where it falls relative to the other thermochronometers. Of course, I also, now having done some more work in the helium system, feel like, well, there might be some other chemical factors or radiation damage factors or other factors that haven't been considered before that might, in fact, influence the closure temperatures of rutils of different composition or something. So there could be some other factors going on in our understanding of how lead diffuses in rutile. I have a real quick comment. 